again, praying for our country. Um, and yet scripture tells us clearly that's what we need to do. We need to pray for our governing authorities. And so that's what we do. But it's been a tough week, hasn't it? We realize that depravity is all around us. And it lurks in our own hearts, doesn't it? Therefore, we come together today and we say, we need you, Lord. We need you. We need you to move in our own hearts. We need you to move in our midst. Tough to make a transition from that, but I'm going to have to. So my question for you today as we begin looking at Colossians chapter 3 is, what do you do? Do you need me to clarify that? <laughs> what do you do for work? We've only been here about six months, not quite six months, somewhere around there. We're not counting, but something like that. I know that some of you here are ranchers, right? Some of you are contractors. Some of you are artists. Some of you are teachers. Some of you are full-time stay-at-home moms. Some of you own a business. Some of you are in the military. Some of you are students. Some of you are retired. My next question for you is this. How do you do what you do? How do you do your work? It's a good question, isn't it? Did you know this? The way that you go about your work is a reflection of the gospel. How many of us have heard that before? But how many of us get to Tuesday afternoon or Wednesday morning, right? Hump day. <laughs> how many of us get to that point and it's like, oh Lord, I can't wait for Friday, right? What was that? Monday morning. Monday morning. I can't wait for Friday. Right? Some of us, maybe that's the place we're in. But you know what we need to do this morning? I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced that we need to again see the truth. We need to remind each other of the truth that the way that we do our work is a reflection of the gospel. The way in which we go about our work is a way to show that Christ is the greatest treasure that can be had. Yet how often do we really think of that? And you might be sitting there thinking, how in the world? When I'm driving this heavy machinery, how do I make that a reflection of the gospel? Well, I'm glad that you asked. This text tells us. What does it tell us? It tells us, do your work wholeheartedly. Do your work wholeheartedly or heartily as to the Lord. And you might be saying, okay, those are nice sounding words, but what does that really mean? That means you do your work joyfully as to the Lord. Think about this for a moment. Who has given you the ability to work? And I'm not necessarily talking about those who are bringing home a W-2. I'm talking about all of us who have been given something to do when we get out of bed in the morning. We do our work joyfully. We do our work to the best of our ability as to the Lord. Do you believe this? Do you believe that the Lord has given you a platform at your work? Now I'm talking about those who do bring a W-2 home, <laughs> okay? But do you realize that the Lord has put you there for a reason? 
And it's greater than just you bringing money home for your family, as great as that is, as necessary as that is. It's so that he can be seen as great. However, we often don't see our work the way that we should. We see it as something we must do. We see it as something we have to slog through. Some of us maybe even dread going to work. Or, or, some of us go the opposite direction and we worship our work. Huh, that's kind of fascinating too, isn't it? It's countercultural to see our work in a proper manner, the way that I just described. It's countercultural, but it's also counter flesh. Our flesh doesn't really like to work that hard. I remember when I was a kid, I've been in a lot of ministry positions since like college, and really for the most part, I, I've rarely had a day that I didn't really want to go to work. I, I've had days when I've been tired, days when I've been worn out, days that I've, I've not had a lot of motivation, but it's not been because of what the Lord has given me to do. But I remember when I was a kid, before I could go swimming during the summer, I had to fill a bucket of weeds. I had to fill a bucket of weeds. My mom had rock gardens. She had a vegetable garden. It seemed like we had gardens all over the place. My brother and my sister and I were responsible to keep them weed-free. And I am telling you, that was the worst job in the world. I hated it. I hated pulling weeds. And the thing with dandelions is if you don't get them out by the root, then what happens? They just come back the next day. So you got to make sure you're using the digger. We got a little smart, though, because we had a compost pile behind our garage where we would dump the piles of weeds from the days before. And so eventually we, we thought, well, maybe we could just kind of put some weeds in the bottom of that bucket, not picking them. Um, and then we would fluff them. We would fluff them. <laughs> fluff the weeds. I mean, there are like 10 weeds in there, but it looks like a full bucket. And so the reason that I share that with you is that I think I can relate. If you're in that spot where you struggle day after day to keep in the forefront of your mind, this is a reflection of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I wish I'd been told that as a kid. No one told me that. I just knew I had to go out there in the hot sun and get it done before I could go swimming. The summary of this text for us today is this. It's simple. It's work heartily as to the Lord. Work heartily as to the Lord. As we dig into this text, there are a couple questions I wanted to ask. I think four or five of them in your notes there. The first question that we need to ask is, the first word in my Bible, and I've got an older ESV version, the one that Dan read was a newer ESV version, the ones in your pews, they're a little newer version, okay? But the first word in the text in my Bible is slaves. It's slaves. So the question that we need to ask here is, is the Apostle Paul condoning slavery? Is he condoning slavery in this text? Absolutely not. Absolutely not not. Now this is challenging for us to see. It's challenging for us to look back at the context that this is written in and to realize, no, we're not, we're not, Paul is not condoning slavery here. If we think about what's happened in the United States in the 1700s, the 1800s, we, we have a hard time reading this, don't we? We read it through that lens. But in those days, this was just customary. This was just part of their culture. Scripture never advocates slavery. Hear this loud and clear. But Scripture does recognize it as an element of ancient society. That's helpful for me. It's an element of ancient society that could have been more beneficial if slaves and masters had treated, them, had treated each other in a better way, if they had treated each other properly. In Greek culture, the concept of slavery most often referred to the involuntary, permanent service of a slave. 
Slaves in both Greek and Roman culture had no rights legally and were treated as commodities. Therefore, there was much abuse and mistreatment of slaves. But actually in this text, in Romans chapter 3, verse 22, the Greek word for slave is doulos. I don't expect you to remember that. But it can be translated bondservant, and probably more accurately is translated bondservant. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, Paul elevates this word by using it in its Hebrew sense to describe a servant who willingly commits himself to serve a master he loves and respects. Do you hear? Oh, that's completely different. Very, very different. Bond servants were actually considered part of the household or the family. Therefore, therefore, as I studied this text and read what commentators had to say about it, they were, what they were doing is they were saying this equals, this, this applies in our current culture to all employee-employer relationships. In other words, we're interpreting this scripture properly by applying it to our modern day employer employee relationships. Question number two is this, who is this text for? You may have thought when you saw that this was the text today, you might have thought we're getting a break. We're getting a break today, right? He's not going to talk directly to me. Remember men last week? Fathers, children, Remember what we talked about the week before was husbands and wives? Men, you probably are feeling a little bit beat up. Hopefully not, but maybe a little bit. Um, I praise the Lord that you came back today. Um, you may have thought you were going to get a break when you saw that the topic was slaves and, and work and the gospel, but no. Um, in fact, none of us get a break today. This is applicable to all of us. It's applicable to all of us who get up in the morning and have something to do. Have something that God has given us to do. The third question is this. Is there dignity in work? Is there dignity in the work that God has given you to do? And, and trust me when I'm saying this. It isn't about a W-2 form. It's has the Lord given you something to do? Maybe you're retired and you're and what the Lord is calling you to is ministering to your spouse or ministering to your kids or I don't know. But all of us are included in this. I want to make sure that that point is very, very clear. So is there dignity in work? Third question. Absolutely. Why is there dignity in work? Because it's been given to us by God. Do you understand that before the fall of Adam and Eve into sin, that Adam was placed in the garden to work it. Did you know that? Before the fall into sin, they had to work. Adam and Eve were placed there to work the garden. Now, they probably weren't pulling weeds, right? I don't think they existed yet. That's a result of the fall, I'm pretty convinced. Especially those summers that I was filling up those buckets. This has to be a result of the fall, right? Genesis 2 verse 15 says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Genesis 3 is where they fall into sin. You might be saying, yeah, but okay, so what is the result of the fall? Well, the result of the fall is difficulty, hardship in our work. Okay, we, we, this, we need to have this clear though. How many of us have, have really taken the time to develop a theology of work? And how does this relate to the gospel? How does this relate to God? Um, it's important for us to remember this. Work, is, work has dignity because it's given us by God. But difficulty, hardship in work is a result of the curse. Genesis 3 verses 17 through 19 says this, And to Adam, he, God said, Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Did you hear that? Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Here it is. Thorns and thistles. <laughs> Mom, do you hear what we're saying? 
Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you turn to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. There it is. The result of the fall, I'm going to say it one more time. The result of the fall was not work, but hardship in work. Fourth question, what is this text saying? What is this text saying? The context of this text, once again, is so important. Those of you that have been here the last couple of weeks, you've heard me say this numerous times. I'm going to say it again. You're probably going to get sick of it. He sounds like a broken record. He's telling me the same thing every week. You know why I tell you the same thing every week? Because we forget it. We forget the truth of the gospel. One ancient scholar said, we leak it. It leaks out of us. So we have to be told again, fill that cup up again every Sunday. In fact, not just every Sunday, every day. Every day we need to be reminded of the truth of the gospel. So here's the context of this text. You're going to remember this. The first two chapters of the book of Colossians are the gospel. The true statements, this is what is true because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is what he's done for you. Now this is what is true. Remember Colossians chapter 2 when we talked about him nailing the debt of sin that was against us. Remember I hit my finger. It hurt. Um, that's what we were talking about. This is the gospel. The debt of our sin was nailed to Christ on the cross. We see this throughout the first two chapters. Paul is unpacking the gospel and he's saying these things are true. These things are true because of the gospel. In chapter 3, we saw put off the old man and put on the new. Like I said, Paul had basically spent the first half of Colossians laying out the gospel indicatives, the true statements about the gospel. These things are true because of the good news of what Christ has done for us on the cross. I realize that I'm repeating myself. But this is something that we have to be remembering every day. In the second half of the book of Colossians, Paul is giving us imperatives or commands that are based on the truths of the gospel that he has been sharing in the first half. He's saying, because of these truths in the first half, now live in such a way that your lives adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ. Live in such a way that displays the worth of the Savior. You might be tired of hearing this by now. I pray that you're not. But this is so important for us to remember. Do you know what struck me this week as I was thinking about this text? I could preach to you all day long. I could preach till I was red in the face. Maybe I'm already red in the face, but I, I could stand up here all day long and tell you, do your work heartily as for the Lord. You know what? It wouldn't make a bit of difference. You have to be empowered by gospel truth. That's the only thing that can change you. That's the only thing that can change me. Otherwise, it's just me striving in human effort. And you know how long that lasts? Maybe till Monday at noon. What struck me this week was this question. Do I delight in my Savior? And I would ask you that same question. Do you delight in your Savior? Does it give your heart joy when we sing what Christ did for us on the cross? If you do not, my question for you is, are you a believer? Have you trusted Christ for salvation? Have you placed your faith in him? Because becoming a believer means that your desires have changed. You no longer want to sin. We still do sin. Amen? Anyone who's been a Christian for five minutes? Right? But it's a good question that struck me between the eyes this week. Do I delight 
in my Savior? And it struck me that this is why Paul spent the first two chapters of this book. And you've got to remember, they were reading it as a letter. They weren't taking two verses every week and saying, come back next week, let's hear what the Apostle Paul had to say. No, they read this whole letter in one sitting. By the time they were done with the second chapter, they were bouncing off the ceiling for joy. They were doing handstands because of how awesome Christ is, because of how awesome the gospel is, because of how undeserving we are. So do we delight in the gospel? If so, then this is how we'll want to live. Husbands, we will want to love our wives. Fathers, we will want to, to, to nurture our children. We'll want to not exasperate them. We'll want to train them up in the knowledge and instruction of the Lord. When we go to work, we're going to want to do it as to the Lord. Because of the gospel. Do you see how different that is? Than saying, okay, I just got to get the power together somehow. I got to muster up the energy and I'm just going to go to work and I'm just going to be happy. Eh. No, that doesn't work. Look with me at verse 22. We haven't even looked at the text yet, have we? Verse 22. Slaves or bond servants obey in everything those who are your earthly masters. He says obey in everything. This refers to a continuous, uninterrupted submission to one's earthly master or employer. The only exception, hear this now, the only exception being in regard to a command that involves clear disobedience of God's word, right? Your boss tells you to do something illegal, don't do it. You don't do it. You serve a greater master. You might lose your job, but you have saved your integrity, right? Look with me at verse 22. Obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers. What is he talking about, eye service? You know what I'm talking about, don't you? You know those people that work on your team that when the boss comes around, oh, I'm, 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 I'm working hard. The boss walks away, um, solitaire, right? Um, minesweeper. I have no idea what you play nowadays. Uh, that was like 15 years ago, right? We all know people like that, and sometimes that's us too, isn't it? The boss goes away. The cat goes away, the mice will play, right? The cat comes back, the mice shape up. That's just what happens. Act like you're working hard when the boss is around. Rather than this, rather than recognizing that the Lord is always watching, he's the one we really need to be concerned about. Then the Apostle Paul uses this phrase, people pleasers. This is working only to promote one's welfare, one's own welfare, rather than to honor the employer and the Lord, whose servants we really are. Do you see how different it could be if we realized, I'm serving the Lord here, no matter what I do. Whether my job is to change diapers all day, or whether it's to be the pastor of this church, whatever, anything in between. And I don't even mean it that way. You know what I'm saying? Whatever the Lord gives you to do, you are the Lord's servant. Then in verse 22, he says, as people pleasers, not as people pleasers, but with, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. This isn't cowering in fear. That's not the kind of fear Paul is talking about here. He's talking about a reverent awe. This is what God has done for me in Christ. Therefore, I'm going to live my life in a way that, at least I'm going to attempt to live my life in a way that adorns the gospel, makes God look, makes Christ look great. Verse 23. Whatever you do, work heartily yes, as for the Lord and not for men. Whatever you do. Again, you might be saying, what does it mean to work heartily? 
What does it mean to work heartily as for the Lord? It's doing your work to the best of your ability. We already talked about some of these things, but let me, let me go through them again. To the best of your ability. It's making the most of your time at work or on the job. Whatever the Lord has given you to do. Making the most of your time. Being diligent. That doesn't mean you can't rest. Doesn't mean you can't take a break. But especially if you're bringing home a W-2, that you're not wasting time while you're at work. You're, it's interesting to consider that that's robbing your employer. It's doing your work with a good attitude. It's being grateful for the ability to do meaningful work. Once again, I, I have to say this. Do you realize the ability to work is a gift from God? It's a gift from God. It's not doing our work begrudgingly. It's honoring our employer, honoring your coworkers. If you're an employer, it's honoring your employees with a heart to please the Lord. And remember this, it's not to earn God's favor, but it's because you already have it. Do you hear that? It's not to earn God's favor. It's not to earn his blessing. It's because you already have it in Christ. This is countercultural, like we said. But this is how our lives adorn the gospel. Do we see our work as worship? There have been many, many times where I've prayed with our daughters before school in the morning. Girls, remember this. As you are sitting in your classroom, you are worshiping the Lord. You're using your mind to learn about his good creation. You are using the abilities that he's given you. You are glorifying the Lord as you do that. Students, do you know that? I know that toward the end of the semester and, and going about school and that kind of thing, it, it, man, this can be a drag sometimes, and I don't really want to do this. And, but remember, it's the Lord Christ you're serving. It's the Lord Christ that you're worshiping as you seek to do your best. It's easy to forget that our work is worship, especially when things are difficult or we don't particularly care for our boss or our coworkers, right? So therefore, again, this is the truth that we need to be reminded of. Look with me at verse 24. Knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. What is he saying? What, a, what is this inheritance that he's talking about? Well, Paul here is providing further motivation, as if we really needed that. But he's saying God's credits and rewards will be appropriate to the attitude and action of our work. How often do we think about that? God's credits and rewards will be appropriate to the attitude and action of our work. No good thing done for his glory will be unrewarded. The Lord here ensures, or the Apostle Paul ensures that the Lord, let me try that again, the Lord is ensuring the believer here through the Apostle Paul that he will receive a just eternal compensation for his efforts, even, as, even if his earthly boss doesn't compensate fairly. What's he talking about? He's talking about we get eternal life. We get everything. Earlier in 1 Corinthians, he says, all things are yours in Christ. Not necessarily right now. We're not experiencing that right now. But one day, everything will be ours. We're going to reign with him for eternity. That frees us to not really care about what we acquire now. I lost my place. <laughs> Verse 25. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. There is no partiality. God deals with obedience and disobedience impartially. Christians are not to presume on their faith in order to justify disobedience to an authority or an employer. I think you're getting the gist of this text, right? Can you not? Did you get, are you getting the gist of this text? 
what the Lord is seeking to communicate through the Apostle Paul to us here today. So my questions are, how do you approach your work? These are my closing questions. How do you approach your work? Do you work as if Christ is your greatest treasure? Does your work adorn the gospel? Does your work make Christ look great, the way you go about your work? Are there other people asking about you? This guy's goofy. Or this lady's, why is she working so hard? You ever have those kinds of questions asked about you? Why are they always so joyful? What is it that gives them joy? I'm not trying to poo-poo the difficulties that we have at our work. But I'm saying maybe it's good for us to be remembering this truth right here. What is your disposition while you are doing what you do? Do you do your work diligently with joy, or do you just try to make it through each day? Work heartily as to the Lord. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me? Dear Father, this is a challenge. Lord, this is a challenge for all of us. And dear Lord, for some of us, this might be a challenge because we don't have the Holy Spirit living in us. So it makes sense. We can't conjure this up. Lord, if that's true of someone here today, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. I pray that today would be the day that they would see the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That Christ died on the cross for sinners. That he was raised three days later from the grave for sinners. And that he sits at the right hand of the Father. His work has been completed, and yet he continues to make intercept, intercession for the saints, for the believers. Dear Lord, if there are some here today who are not believing, who, have not, who are not trusting Christ for salvation, I pray today would be the day that they would turn to you in repentance and faith, that they would confess their sins, that they would... That they would say, Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I want to trust you for salvation. I do trust you. The way to receive Christ isn't found in some formula or in some particular words, but it's, it's trusting him. It's like saying you trust the parachute and then jumping out of the plane. Rather than sitting on the plane acting like you trust it. Lord, some of us have trouble with this because we battle with the flesh every day. There's a war that's waging. And Lord, we pray that as we behold Christ, that we would be changed from the inside. And then that our lives would truly adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ, that our work would adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ. We all need you for this. Father, we need you to help us and obey this text. So, Lord, we praise you for how it points us to Christ, the one who never struggled with this, never struggled with a bad attitude. Always was his joy to do the will of him who sent Christ. Lord, I pray that we remember that. We also praise you. Father, that Christ is a great high priest who is there to help us in time of need. So, Lord, and again, we praise you for this time, and we pray that your word would be embedded deeply in our hearts. Lord, I pray that we would delight in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then that this would just flow naturally from us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. that you have given us, Father. We praise you that we've been able to sing the gospel. We've been able to read the gospel. We've been able to hear the gospel. We've been able to see the gospel. Dear Father, we praise you for this visible reminder of what Christ has done for us. Dear Lord, we pray that we would go in the strength and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. In the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you that are here today. And all God's people said, Amen.
Thank you for being here today. May God bless each of you as you go. You're dismissed.